Cyborg decided to sponsor DevOps Talks this year um, because we were looking to uh, do some outreach to the DevOps community in the Melbourne area and we heard about DevOps Talks as having a stellar reputation as the event to go to, the conference to go to for DevOps uh, in the Melbourne area. Now, this is a great opportunity for outreach to a bunch of DevOps practitioners and I was surprised to see the number of DevOps security professionals that were also in the audience. Our product is a security product designed for DevOps teams, uh, particularly around secrets management, privileged access control in DevOps environments and this seems like the right opportunity to both educate and start a discussion with the DevOps community in Melbourne. So, Good morning, everyone. My name is Mirko Herring, and I work with Legacy Technologies. Um, I thought that kind of confession was important to make after a day and a half of talking about microservices and serverless and so forth. Um, if you look at my, uh, my lifelong uh, record of what code I've written, I think, unfortunately, at the, the top two languages would be COBOL and C. Um, so, well, um, I will not bore you with COBOL or C examples in this, in this talk. Um, so, um, I, talk, uh, I, I call this talk, What Got You Here Won't Get You There, a story of transformations. Um, as Evgeny mentioned in the introduction, um, I spend a lot of my time with clients talking about um, their transformation, and I will um, share my, my lessons with you. Uh, some of these lessons are expensive to make, um, and so uh, rather than you paying for it yourself, you can learn from my mistakes. A little bit more about myself. Um, so. I uh, got introduced with, uh, I'm looking after our Agile and DevOps practice, or how I would like to call it good delivery, but good delivery doesn't really sell as much as Agile and DevOps, so I changed that. Um, at work, I'm running a, a, a small group of people here based in, in Australia, around 60 people, um, and we are working with, with our clients to really help them um, accelerate delivery. I have a blog, which is not a factory anymore. Um, doesn't really sound like an IT blog, um, but you'll I'll explain where the name comes from in a second, and um, if Kenny mentioned the book. Uh, I know there's still a few copies out there, though if you haven't got one, um, you might still be able to get one if you go outside um, after the talk and, and ask nicely. All right, so let's get into this. Um, it would be unfair if I wouldn't mention uh, the actual book that, in that uh, inspired the title, um, What Got You Here Won't Get You There. Not sure whether any of you have read this. Um, it's a really cool book for, for managers, and the idea is that <coughs> Um, there are certain things that you do in your early career that makes you really successful. And then when you become a manager, all of a sudden these same traits that you had before um, are letting you down. Um, and so the book goes through 25 of those examples and um, it was one of the first books I read when I became a manager and it was really, really helpful because I was, I, I, I'm a recovering developer. Um, so, uh, and as a developer, as you might know, like, we are very technical focused. Um, we might not necessarily think about the people side of things. Um, we also are always right. I mean, you know, our code is better than anyone else's. You would have noticed that. Um, so this book really helped me along the way. I want to, I use exactly the same example for um, why transformations feel so hard. So I'm not going to ask you, but I would assume that all of you have gone through one, two, three, four, five, six different transformations at your companies. Um, the idea of a transformation is that you start at some stage and, you know, let's, you know, at the caterpillar and then you become this beautiful butterfly at the end. Um, now the question is, if that's the case, why do we keep transforming? Like, you know, if, you, if, you haven't re if we have reached the butterfly stage, um, why are we still doing this? Um, I wrote an, an article uh, a while ago, because one of the things that really surprised me, so I, I got into IT in the kind of late 90s. Um, I was writing compiler code for, for IBM, working with microprocessors, um, and back then the world was slightly different to how it is today, um, not surprisingly. But, Everything was relatively automated, right? So we had small teams working onshore in a research lab. Um, used to work for IBM, um, so it was a kind of a, a cool research lab in Switzerland, um, where you know the eccentrics of the developers go to the point that people come to work on horses. Um, really interesting environment to work in. Um, lots of people bar barefoot, and it's like you know if you think about the Googles of the day, that was kind of nearly like that. Um, but the only way for us to be more efficient and to focus more on getting good code out was to automate all the other stuff, right? Because it was pretty expensive to have someone doing manual deployment or something like that if they are a well-paid researcher. Now, 15 years later, you know, I slept at the wheel and woke up and they're like, well, look around and, you know, look at the kind of clients I work with, look at what I hear and, and see in blog posts, and when I talk to people at conferences, and it feels like we are nowhere closer. Like, I mean, there's a lot of really cool technologies, 
But the reality in the, in the hard enterprise world is that a lot of the stuff is still being done manual. I mean, we, we had to bring up, we had to use a new term, DevOps, all of a sudden to make it sexy again. Um, so what's the reason for that? And I will try to explain it or, or provide some, some ideas on why I think we got here, which is what is in that, uh, in that blog post, so you can, you can read it in more detail. But you get, I'll give you the summary. This is a pretty generic uh, maturity model, as you would have seen in many, uh, many places. This is our one from Accenture, but um, you know, it doesn't really matter what it is. They all look very similar. This one goes from minus one to three. We were, back then, we changed it now to uh, one to five because clients don't appreciate the minus rating so much. But anyway, so this goes from minus one to, to three. Um, and really, when I started working, we were in this kind of consistent to optimize space, in my view. Lots of stuff was automated. We had horrible tools for it. So the first three times that I've automated something was with Control M, with uh, Perl scripts, with like all kinds of tools that you know I, Jenkins wasn't in, wasn't even discovered or created back then. Um, I discovered it much later than it was created. So my own fault. Um, but it started then that we, we started to, to offshore work. We started to use a lot of SAP. So when I, when I started working, everyone said, you need to be an SAP developer. I did my first project on SAP and realized, well, I want to be a developer and not just someone who clicks things together. Um, so I abandoned my SAP career. Um, and all these things uh, allowed us to find a shortcut. Right? So if you looked at how you can reduce cost, uh, it was the easy way of uh, moving the same work from uh, high salary location into a lower salary location. Um, and with that, you didn't have to focus so much on the engineering. You didn't have to focus so much on the automation because you could get the same cost benefit um, by just doing it somewhere else. You have to have three people doing it manually um, at a lower cost than having an expensive engineer writing the automation. Yeah. You had these packaged software that did a lot of the stuff for you. you know, if you're using um, and I have nothing against many of these tools because I work with them, um, but you know, the Siebel, for example, provides their own configuration management. SAP provides their own transport managers. So why would you then you know, start building automation on top of that? It kind of makes no sense. Um, but what we then realized at some stage is they're all living in ecosystems, and now you're struggling to get these ecosystems uplifted because you're all kind of, you're caught in these, uh, in these individual walled gardens and, and protected spaces. So that's where we ended up in the back. And then uh, I've been doing this, as, as my intro says, for uh, many, many years. Um, and back then, no one wanted to talk about that. And so if I would walk around and say, like, we should talk, um, in Accenture, we used to call the development architecture. Um, you know, development architecture is really important, and we need to do the automation. No one wanted to talk to you about it. I mean, that's, that's not, the, not, not interesting to clients. And then came DevOps, and DevOps started to make its stuff sexy again. Right? And now everyone wants to talk about DevOps. We have whole conferences for it. So, um, lucky little Mirko, who was kind of toiling away in the corner, all of a sudden had a sexy topic to talk about. And everyone wanted to start talking to me about that. Um, and now we're basically trying to get back to where we were before. We have much better tools. It's much faster. Um, but we still are struggling with some of the, um, the things that we've inherited over the years. Yeah, so this is kind of my explanation why we are still kind of still have DevOps conferences, still have DevOps talks, um, because we, we haven't really mastered it um, across the board. Some have, but... Um, I mean, we can talk about it afterwards whether your organization has done it. Um, and this is the kind of people that we want to be like. Um, it's probably interesting if you ever meet people from these organizations to talk to them about how it looks like when you're actually in there. Um, but I will, I will leave that for another day. I know some of those guys. Um, another thing, and I, I talked about that before, right? this is kind of this typical transformation cycle. Um, we have somebody here at the, at the bottom. We have a real business problem. Um, we're going to do a transformation. And then we get to this end state. Yeah? Who here has heard about the end state? Um, the end state architecture? Um, we really believe that that exists back in the day. Yeah? And so you spend five years to implement it. You get to the stable state. Um, the stable state, you know, kind of last few months just to get this transformation done. You can really hard work, long weekends. Um, and then you're there. Yeah, you um, and then your business comes around and says, OK, cool, now we've done this. We've spent gazillions of dollars. Um, now we need to kind of dial that back. And so we do cost reductions. And then you know, if you want to start continuing the implementation of automation, like, ah, perhaps in the next project, you know, in this project, we really just need to get the functionality out there. Um, and you start accruing technical debt. You go all the way down here. Um, and then you do the same thing again. A fantastic business model for consultancies, tech vendors, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> Where we want to be is in this world, right? We want to understand that we, uh, we, we are kind of transforming, and we're doing, you know, we're transforming to agile and DevOps, which is what we're talking about here. Um, but then as we start kind of sliding back, um, we want to have the right way of finding the new stimulus that keeps moving us forward. 
Um, and that's not easy. Right? It's not easy to understand at what point you're sliding back. It's not easy to um, have the vigilance to um, ask the right questions and stay the course. Yeah? But that's kind of the, the idea behind this. So this is, um, I call it the anti-transformation transformation. Yeah, because this should really be the transformation to end it all. Um, uh, perhaps there's Skynet that will also end it all, but um, this is my approach to it. So, now why did we do this, and why are we struggling with this so much? So, to me, it comes back down to working with the wrong mental model. And a wrong mental model is, a, is something that you have in your head, um, in, your, in your mind, that allows you to do an interpretation of what you perceive. Doesn't mean it's reality, and all our realities are slightly different, but it gives you a way of um, interpreting what you're seeing. I will, um, and it has an image on it. Um, now, I'm not going to ask you what you see, um, but if you have young children, when you ask them what they see, they see nine dolphins, yeah, which is probably what all of you saw. Um, <laughs> if not, you have to question your mental model. Um, but that shows you just how, uh, no matter what we look at, I mean, the ob it's objective the same thing, um, once you see the dolphins, you can't really see anything else anymore, right? Because the mental model has shifted. And in IT, we have the same mental model that we used you know, 15 years ago. And we haven't really done the shift that we needed to. So um, I think this is a fantastic quote. Um, so right now, your company has uh, 21st century internet-enabled business processes, mid-20th century management processes, all built atop 19th century management principles. Yeah, that's the reality of our life. Um, because... A lot of what we do in IT still comes from a, from a manufacturing idea of, of management. Yeah, I mean, you would have heard perhaps about software factories, um, about resources. Right? You know, I've just moving three resources from this project to that, resource, uh, to that project. I use 1.5 FTEs. Yeah, these are all things that are coming from a manufacturing world because you can't really move a half an FTE. I don't know how you would. Um, and it feels really kind of disappointing when someone says, you know, you are half an FTE on this project. It's like, no, I'm a full person. Um, <laughs> So, but that comes from that, from that world, and back then it was correct when you think about manufacturing, right? I mean, in manufacturing, if you think about, you know, the, take the, the, the Charlie Chaplin movie, Modern Times, uh, you know, you're in an assembly line, and, you know, if I take you out there and put another person in there, as long as you know how to screw that screw in, that's okay, you can replace them. Um, in IT, that doesn't work. I mean, you know, if you've tried that, you've replaced one of the guys in your team with someone else, um, they're not immediately as efficient as they were before, or even better. If you replace me on your project, you might get someone better. Um, but then you don't get these kind of cool talks. So let's look at this example. So um, there's a couple of things, I think, in manufacturing that um, was correct a bit earlier, um, but it's just not correct anymore. So, and some of them have never, perhaps never been right. One of the things in manufacturing is a predictable production process allowing you to measure productivity and define output. And who here has been asked, you know, I want to measure productivity of my IT teams? Kind of a common question. Um, and it comes from that, because in, in production, if you produce the same Model T car again and again and again, you can measure productivity. You can measure how much process work goes in there, how long it takes, and how much material you put in there. How many of you are doing the same IT project twice? Hmm, probably not that many. And if you do, um, hmm, why? Um, so you can't really measure it that way, right? It's always a different problem. It's always a different, different thing. And the measures of productivity are really not appropriate anyway, like lines of code or function points or any of those kind of things, right? It just doesn't work that way. Um, otherwise, you would all continue to update HTML pages and would never invented CSS sheets. Hmm. So ba it's based on functional special specialization of labor. Again, right, it's the, 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 the testers that are sitting in the testing center of excellence, the developers sitting in the developer factory, um, and that's how we do IT delivery. I mean, that's what we did in the factories, right? We had these different assembly lines. Someone was screwing, someone was um, tying it together, someone was checking it, and that worked. Unfortunately, in IT, you lose a lot of context when you do that. Um, and with that context loss, you have a lot of communications, you have a lot of documents, you have a lot of meetings, and all that actually does not necessarily improve quality. As much as some people believe that more documents mean more quality, it's not actually true. Importance of upfront planning. In the old days, I mean, for factories, you need to build a factory, you need to build a machinery, you need to put all that together. Great. 15 years ago, if you wanted to run a big IT project, that was similar. You had to order servers, they needed to be brought into your data center, you needed to lay cables, right? There was a whole bunch of upfront planning that you needed to do, and if you then wanted to change that, that meant you had another three months waiting for the next server to come in. Nowadays, you put your credit card down, you get them from AWS or cloud uh, or Amazon, um, and off you go. Yeah, so this is not appropriate anymore. 
Automation is improving productivity. This is kind of where most of the factory analogies come from when we talk about DevOps. So you would have heard about um, you know, the Toyota uh, production system, Lean, and so forth. That comes from Toyota. And that's still correct. That is absolutely correct. And that's the only one um, that I can find where the factory analogy actually works. Yeah? Um, when I wrote my book, and you will, uh, if, you, if, you, if you have a copy and you know, read at least a couple of pages, you will see that I talk about that. Uh, Gene Kim, who is um, uh, the, well, the guy behind the, the publisher who published my book, um, he had a huge problem with me talking about this factory analogy because he uses Toyota as an example again and again. And I said, well, that's for us. But that's, that's academic creep, right? Because for us, when we think about factories, we think about Toyota. Well, if you go to your boss and your managers and so forth, when they think about manufacturing, they think of Ford, right? So we need to, well, at least in my MBA, what you're getting taught is manufacturing management, not creative management, which is what we are doing. Right? We are creating creative solutions. We are creative workers in IT. We are not just production people that create code. And then economies of scale and effort of scaling. Uh, if you have one factory and you basically clone the same factory next door, you can pretty much guarantee that you will get about double the output. Um, if you have one Agile team, you create another Agile team next to it, and uh, you get double the, effort, double the output? Hmm. No, you're going to spend more time in meetings. <laughs> so, no, scaling is really hard. Uh, someone at some stage, when, so I, when I started doing Agile, was still kind of seen as something you really don't do in big companies. Um, and someone told me, like, you know, Agile really only works when you have like five people or so in a room working together face to face. And I'm like, well, anything works if you have five people in a room face to face. You don't, have a, you don't need a methodology. Like, you really don't. Methodologies come in when it's more complex, when you're scaling it, when distribution comes in. And distribution, by the way, doesn't necessarily mean here in India or here in the Philippines or here in China. Uh, between Sydney and Melbourne, it's distributed. Yeah, because you need to start agreeing on meetings. You can't just um, walk over to someone, um, and that's all a function of, of scaling, and that makes it harder. Right, so hopefully you agree with me that we should really burn that factory down um, and talk about something different. So um, with that out of the way, <laughs> so that's kind of my, my justification why I think we are still where we are, um, but there are answers. So there are some ways that you can approach this, and um, I try to condense it into something that um, has a little bit of a model, which is the slide, um, and then behind it, some, uh, some guidance and some, some help. Right? So there's three things that you, you need to look at. So there's the ecosystem of vendors and applications. It's probably the thing that people talk the least about um, because most organizations do have more than one. They're not just in-house. Um, they have vendors like us. They have vendors like uh, technology vendors like SAP or Oracle or Salesforce. Um, so how do you actually align all that? Like how, when we talk about culture, it's easy to say when you have full control, but now you have contracts in the middle and you have uh, conflicting SLAs and KPIs. So how do you actually do that? I will, yeah, I'm not just asking the questions. I'll give you some ideas about this, so don't worry. Um, then you need to talk about how we actually organize ourselves and, um, with knowledge workers in mind. And then, of course, there's the cool stuff that we all want to talk about, technology architectures, where all the continuous delivery cloud microservices comes in. Um, one thing that is absolutely crucial for this, though, is that in the middle you have this rigorous continuous improvement process. Um, so um, a few years ago I sat together with a bunch of other people who do um, like kind of transformational coaching. And one thing that we wanted to find out is, so what is common when we go into a client and we have the feeling that we can achieve something or when we get in there and we feel like you know, we're never going to get any there? And the one thing that we could all agree on is, is that continuous rigorous improvement um, that, that we needed um, as a kind of core competency. And what that is, is not lessons learned. It's not retrospective. It's not having big checklists of what we want to improve. It's actually being able to run experiments when you do something. So when we introduce automated unit testing, is something actually getting better? And that means you need to measure a baseline, you do something, and then you measure the result. And surprise, surprise, right? About half of these things will not actually make a difference, right? But right now, you don't know which half that is. It's like an old marketing saying, right? Half of the marketing money is wasted. I just don't know which half. And that's exactly the same for us. I have good friends who, um, who saw that when they, when they increased the, the test coverage in their, in their unit testing, it made no difference to production defects or integration defects. But they spent a lot of money on that. So they dialed that back. Yeah? And that's, but that's now actually making decisions based on an economic system. Right? Not just because, hey, more coverage is better, right? I mean, I need to get to 98% or whatever arbitrary number you set yourself. All right, so let's look at a couple of these. Um, 
you will get these slides afterwards. You don't need to make photos, by the way. Um, and I will speak relatively quickly about most of them. Some of them might dive a bit deeper. Some of them might just wave over. So we'll see how we go. Um, I'm trying to stay within the time window. <laughs> um, so the very first thing is small batches. And this is perhaps, again, a little bit um, esoteric, but I think it's important. Um, so if you're doing any kind of manufacturing courses in, in, in university, you will get into production functions. Um, and you know, to get to the right batch size, uh, you need to understand your holding cost and your transaction cost. Holding cost is things like the warehouse that you're holding the product in. Transaction cost is the configuration of your machines to actually deliver the product. In IT, um, holding costs are ultimately functionality that you've built but not released. Yeah, it's all that kind of code that has been written that doesn't actually produce value yet. Um, and the transaction cost is for us to get it into production. So setting up environments, deployments, regression testing, penetration testing, um, all those kind of goodness. So when you have all these functions, you get to the batch size. Now, we talked about it. We have you know, continuous delivery. We have cloud. We have microservices. So we can actually drive the transaction cost down. And that means our batch size moves to the left and gets smaller. The economically right thing gets smaller. Great. There's a corollary to this. If you do not make any difference to the transaction cost, small batch sizes become really expensive. Right? So if you're an organization that has just gone down the agile path without doing any automation, you just discovered that that all of a sudden the regression testing that you need to do every two weeks is really expensive and it's manual, right? That deploying into an environment five times a week rather than once a month is really expensive if it's manual, yeah? So the corollary to that is, I think, more important than the, this direction, which is if you really want to get to these small batches that you can enable with Agile, you need to change your transaction costs, and that's an investment that you need to make along the way. Um, architecture is kind of a dirty secret, and we spoke about that a lot. These are just a couple of, of ways that, you know, as I said, I work with legacy. So for me, it pretty much always looks like this. There's some stuff in the back. Um, by the way, I learned a new term recently. It's heritage. It's not legacy. It's heritage. <laughs> um, so we have the heritage systems, and then we have the access layer. Right? And you can either go to simplify the core. This is kind of you know, going on a diet. Let's make this thing smaller, that it actually behaves. Um, you can get into this kind of value-added services, which we see a lot in the mainframe world, where you create services that then be consumed from a digital end. Um, you can go down the microservice path, um, or, and uh, be warned, you can create a new silo, a new digital silo, um, which is great if you, at some stage, want to move everyone into that new silo. But if you try to integrate that silo back into your old world, that can be a very painful experience for everyone involved. But it's important that you have a view of this. There's not one way to do this. Um, I'm a consultant. It depends. Um, that's why you pay me. <laughs> um, but these are possible ways. Yeah? And perhaps there are some others, but I haven't really discovered any, any others. Um, and this gives you a, a pass through that. Um, we talked about this, uh, the continuous improvement part. Um, I'm really uh, a nut for data. Uh, so I have a math degree. Um, and I love playing with numbers. And one thing that continues to frustrate me was that you, know, you have all these cool tools and all this automation. But try to get the data out of there is impossible. Right? You have to go, if you want to look at burnups, then I have to look at Jira and at version one and rally and you know, all that kind of stuff is different because everyone has different sprint lengths and different points. Um, some of the data is in Jenkins, some of it is in Selenium. And you know, if I want to make any correlation there, I need to dig through all this stuff. Um, so with my team, we, we created a, a dashboard to bring all these things together. Um, and what it allows you to do is, I think, some useful things. Um, it will also really overwhelm any executive. So if you want to, you know, if you want to find the right data in there, you will find the right data. Um, but it can be really useful. And one of the things that I really like is this thing here at the bottom. Um, so this here on the right hand side is a real time re release readiness. It's a score, and this score is coming is something that we define yeah, as an organization, not me as me, but you as you, like you know whoever defines this for their own organization. And it takes a couple of things in there. So it's like, you know, how many late requirement changes did we have? How many open defects do we have? What's our um, frequency of build failures, of deployment failures, regression failures, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Right? And based on that, you create a score. Now, when you do that, then you can compare the score of a release, which you can see here, against the impact that you had on production after you went live. Now, what does it allow you to do? Well, A, it allows you to learn so you can update the function. But I think what is more important when you get into the same thing like a change approval board, um, I will tell you a story about myself, and yours is probably much better. Um, but you go into a change approval board, and they look at you and say, are we ready to release? And I'm like, yep, we are. The status is green. Um, and you know, we have hit all the, the numbers. Um, what happens is 
the most senior guy in the room, he looks you in the eyes and is like, you know, are you sure? And then you say yes, and then you go live. That's not a terribly scientific way of doing this, in my view. Um, but here we can now get, look, we have a release vagrant score of 92. In our history, we had five releases of above 90, and they all had minimal impact, right? Or look, actually, we have a score of 92, but we know that if we are under 95, we can expect some problems in production. Only if we have over 95, um, we, are, we, are, we are safe. Now, it's a much more scientific conversation. Now, one thing that you will realize as I talk about this, if you do one release a year, this data takes a long time to build up. Yeah, when we come back to the whole feedback cycle, you need to do this very frequently to build up the data that actually allows you to learn, just like we had the conversation about AI earlier. Yeah, and you could probably build AI here that autom optimizes that for you. Another thing that is in here is uh, an agile dashboard, and I will kind of blow that up a little bit more. Um, if you work at large organizations, you have lots of agile projects, it's really confusing in my view. Right? You have so many different tools to look at, so many different ways of cutting it. Um, so what we do is we normalize this stuff, so you know, time completions, so we know when the next release is and how many sprints there are, and so we can normalize to 100%. We know how many points we have kind of aimed to achieve, which is again normalized to 100%, and then you get to this nice little graph where you can then see you know, this is the, the bubble size, it's just how much money is in there, so how much money we're investing. And you can see how they're bubbling along. Right? And so you can identify if any of these teams are not actually making enough progress. Ignore the green line. The green line is kind of automatically created, and we all know that no one actually burns along that. But still, you can see um, a, a tendency here. Right? And as a, again, you can learn. And right? if you now pass through this, and you have many, many projects that have gone through this, or many teams, um, then you will learn at what point you have to worry. Yeah? And at that point, you can then um, you know, provide help. So that was kind of the, the, the ecosystem side. Um, Sorry, the technology side. Um, on the people side, it's all about context. I'm not going to drain this too much. Um, but the idea here is obviously that uh, in agile teams, people are, are working around context. And I'm not sure how many of you have, have read Dan Ping's book, Drive, or saw the video for it. Um, what he says is that knowledge workers are motivated by three things, autonomy, autonomy mastery, and purpose. But in agile, it's just the right methodology for that. Right? You have autonomy because you understand the context. Right? I understand what the problem is that we are trying to solve. So as we are delivering, um, I'm trying to solve the problem. I'm not just implementing a design. Now, you have mastery because you have these feedback cycles. You actually learn that you're getting better. And then um, you have purpose because you're, build, you're solving a, um, a business problem rather than uh, just, just implementing something. We talk about platforms a lot, so I'm not going to drain that. Um, here's kind of where it's kind of uncool what I'm going to say now. DevOps teams are not that bad. Oh. Reality is that if you're super, super mature, um, you will not need the de DevOps team. That's fine. Most big organizations will have to have an intermediate step where they have some centralization, because otherwise, um, you know, you have 500 different configurations of Jenkins, um, and when one of them fails when you're trying to get into production, you have no idea what to do, because it was like on someone's server, under the desk, and I've seen it all. Um, so you need to start somewhere where you have some level of centralization somewhere. And if you go to big DevOps conferences, you will notice that that's the case um, in pretty much most organizations. Um, same is true when you look at the state of DevOps report. Um, it's not sexy. You know, it's kind of cooler to say everyone in the team does everything, and we have, uh, you know, we have ops guys in dev. That's all cool. But someone needs to look at um, the platform aspect. And if you use something, something like Google or Amazon, you've basically just outsourced this, right? Because they do that for you. You're not going to ask Amazon on how they're doing all the stuff that happens behind the scenes. You don't need to. Same thing for you in, inside. And then you have these platforms, which are really not project teams. They are teams that are working towards a business function or business service um, and outstanding teams um, that, you, that continue to work and not just on projects. One of the biggest problems we had, in, in my experience, is the whole idea about thinking about projects because projects get funding, right? And so projects have $2 million to achieve something. Um, and then all the engineers say, well, we should really build some of this uh, regression test automation. And then the project sponsor says, that's fantastic. Um, so what do I get out of it? And you say, well, you know, if you do the next project, going to get cheaper. And I said, well, but it's not my project that's next. It's that guy's. <laughs> so, no, not for me. Right? And then you get to the next project, and you have exactly the same conversation again. Right? And that's how you introduce technical debt. If you have a constant stream of funding for these platform teams, um, then you can avoid that situation, because the same person that is funding you now will fund you next time, and the savings are actually coming back to that platform. Evaluating software vendors. Um, so I've done a lot of uh, kind of application evaluations. Um, and it usually is a function of the functionality. Like, you know, does it really do what I'm after? Great. 
I think we need to extend that. We need to extend that by architecture. So how does it actually auto scale, self heal, monitor? How easy is it to change? Like if you have a big monolith and I want to change this, what, am I, what does it actually mean for me? How cloud ready is it? You know, sometimes um, just the licensing model might, might kill you. Yeah, there are certain vendors that if you put them on Amazon, the licensing model will completely kill you. And then you have engineering capabilities. So how easy is it to get to the source code? Are all the APIs there for automation? Right? I used to work with a, with a, a retail stack um, where the only way to deploy it into an environment and build the binary was to go through a UI. So you had to use something like Selenium to press a button to create a binary that you can then store somewhere and deploy. That's crazy, but that's what you had to do. Um, so you want to look at that stuff as well so that you're not getting caught out with that. And then the other thing is that you need to understand how good your in-house IT is. Right? If you have really good in-house IT, the stuff at the top is really important. Right? If you don't really have a lot of capability, then perhaps you have to trust that product vendor. Yeah? Perhaps you have to go with a solution that is um, relatively walled in. But you need to find that, that, that right balance. And then we come to, uh, this, is, this is probably my favorite part. Um, and you'll realize in a second why. Um, so I'm, I'm a vendor. Uh -huh. um, so very often I will talk to organizations and they evaluate us. And that's fantastic if you have the right mechanism. Now, it's not uncommon that you're in a world like this where you have vendor A and you have vendor B. Uh, vendor A costs $100, vendor B costs $80 per day. So which one would you go with? Well, you know, the $80 one gives me the same stuff for the same for, for cheaper. So I'm going to go with that. Okay, let's, let's put ourselves into our new our world now, right? This is a manufacturing view of the world. Let's put ourselves in our world. This is how work looks like, right? There's a lower skilled labor that is cheaper, like the more junior guys, people who fresh from uni or whatever it is. And then you have more skilled work that's a bit more expensive, and you have highly skilled work that's really highly expensive. Um, and most work looks like whether it's a project, whether it's your organization, they all kind of look like this, more or less, unless you're really small. Now, what happens when you automate? What do you think we are automating? Well, we're automating at the bottom of this, right? Because that's the easy bit to automate. Now, what does it do? It drives up the average, the average rate, and it takes the overall cost down. Now, go back to the, the, the decision, uh, the, the example we have with the vendors, right? So in this case, the vendor with a higher rate provides more automation, perhaps. If your vendor comes to you and takes 30% off the average day rate, he's probably not doing automation. And it's just, it's, science, it's math, yeah? Um, but still, a lot of organizations haven't really caught, caught up with that. There's another example, SLAs. Um, so let's just look at something simple. We have a password with that, that's two hours, and we have a Ceph2 in production, and we have for that one day. And then it is a bit more complicated. Now, I'm the ops guy on the, on the day. I'm going to go for lunch. Um, these two things come in after an hour and a half. You know, I'm in Australia. I do a bit of a longer lunch. Might have had a pint. Um, come back. So what do you think I'm going to work on next? Right, I have a ticking clock of my two-hour password with that, and I have the cell phone in production. Right, so I'm going to quickly do the password with that, because that's kind of you know, it's coming, coming down to me. Um, now, what if there's lots of these passwords that's coming through? And what do you think, as an organization, I care more about? Yeah, and that's two SLAs. Most organizations have many of these. And there's lots of unintended consequences of how they interact with each other. Yeah, and this is where the whole idea comes in around, um, you don't actually want to look at something like a strict SLA, you want to look at, um, at trends, uh, KPIs, and how they, how they evolve. We can make this worse. So here's a, a ticketing system, and we have the metric that usually people look at, first time resolution rate, and how quickly we resolve them. Intuitively makes sense, yeah? Like we want to know how good our, our, ticket, uh, our operations team is behind the ticket. Well, what happens when we automate? Right, so if you automate stuff and you do a lot of self-service, um, what do you think are the tickets that are coming through? Are they simpler or more complex? They're more complex. If they're more complex, what does it do to your first-time resolution rate and um, the, the time that it takes to fix them? Right, so they actually move in the different direction. Um, and I've seen this in organizations where people that don't try to automate them with, well, you know, I'm getting evaluated on how many tickets I can close. Right, if I automate this away, then I can't close as many tickets anymore. Yeah? So you need to think about stuff, and that's the ecosystem question that I raised earlier on. You need to really create an ecosystem that supports you in the right way. Um, I'm not going to go through this too much, but there's, um, you know, I, I'm very passionate about the conversation around partners versus vendors. Um, if you're looking for a partner, you should be able to answer these questions with, uh, with yes. 
Um, if you're more looking for vendors, then you will answer them as no. Um, and you, you can see that later in the things. I wish I could just give you the solution for this. I mean, you probably came here saying, hey, cool, transformation. Someone would finally tell me how it works. And you know, I, I, I can sell you snake oil in all flavors if you want to. Um, but reality is it's different, right? It looks a bit like this. So you're going into this transformation. You're going to make early successes. Um, and then stuff becomes hard, right? And then, at that point, people give up, or you, know, you kind of slide back. And really, afterwards, can you get, get, get through? I'll tell you an example of mine. Um, so I did mainframe COBOL um, deployment automation um, for a large organization. And we smashed it. Like, I mean, we, we, we automated it. Um, we did some really, really weird stuff. Um, we put the COBOL code into Microsoft uh, Team Foundation server. Um, and we used uh, an IBM product to automate it. So you can see how, how cr like crude that was. Um, but we automated it. So we got into kind of you know, this point here. We were able to deploy things automatically. And then three weeks later, st st stuff fell apart. <laughs> so we're like, shit, what happened? Um, and you know, we were cocky back then. Um, well, I'm still cocky, but you know, back then I was also cocky. Um, so we deployed overnight, 3 AM in the morning, no man in sight, because you know, it was reliable. Um, by the way, that's a good test for you. If you, if you have automation in your organization, schedule deployment at 3 AM in the morning. That will really keep you honest. Uh, because no one's going to be there to touch the keyboard if they need to. Um, so that's what we did, <laughs> and it failed. Brilliant. Um, turns out that there were certain um, COBOL modules that were only in production. Yeah? And no one knew, no one told us. Um, but at that point, that's not what people think about. They think about, oh, Merco's team. You know, they said they had solved this, and now they're you know, struggling. We have problems in production. They don't know why. All this automation stuff is really not working for us. Right? And so you had, like, for the next however many deployments, you had a whole bunch of operators sitting there watching the automation. And when something failed, guess what they did? They quickly fixed it. The problem, not the automation. Right? And so we now had this whole thing that started building up again of all the manual things we need to do to be successful. Yeah? So it's really hard to stick through this once you kind of get through the early successes, which everyone is celebrating. Um, but then stuff gets hard. Right? And that's where you need your your management, your leadership to actually stand behind you and, and continue pushing through this. Otherwise, you're going to get stuck. Now, that looks pretty um, challenging. Reality is it actually looks like this. So even when you get through that first one, you hit the next one, and you hit the next one, and you hit the next one. Um, and this is, I think, why the, the graph that I showed you up front with this whole transformation part um, is so hard. Uh, because you're just never there. And it's kind of always something new that is harder. Um, I mean, we talk about microservices and automation. and so. We had struggled for many years to get 20 systems into production. Right? Now you have 5,000 microservices. Right? There's a whole new challenge with that. Like your governance and all that kind of stuff is actually not built for that. Right? Our heads are not ready for that. Like how do you actually combine it? Someone had a good question yesterday in one of the talks about how do you actually test all the permutations of all your microservices right? and all those versions? And you have three vendors that are providing these. And you know, they're all incentivized different ways. And it's like, this is hard stuff. Right? And we do not have the answers. And the answer is not technology as much as we like to think. Um, it's technology, governance, and really education of the people. And understanding that this stuff is challenging and that you can't just buy the snake oil unless you come to me, because I have snake oil. Cool. So um, I promise you you can get the slides. So um, if you just send it, uh, an email to mirko at sendyourslides.com and subject DevOps, you will have all these slides. And with that, I will hand over for questions, if you have any. Senior executives need to understand ROI before approving major initiatives. How do you do that without pre-planning productivity delivery estimates? Da, da, da. Fantastic. A um, couple of points on that. Um, so one is ROI is, is surprisingly difficult to use. Um, but one thing that I've learned, um, but not mastered, but learned, um, is that if you use ROI um, adjusted by risk, that you get to much better results. Because you can actually um, put numbers against uh, failure rates and stuff like that. And that will help you with these kind of initiatives. The ROI on automation is surprisingly bad um, because automation is easy when you haven't done anything. Yeah, if, you, if everything is fully manual, then automation has a really high ROI. Most organizations have done the 80% that are easy to automate and are now struggling with the last 20%. And that means I'm now arguing whether the five times the developer needs to, to touch the keyboard that I should spend a million dollars to automate that. 
The problem is the five times he touches that keyboard are five opportunities to make a mistake. Is also why that guy is still there on the weekend and is also there uh, after hours to support something. Right? And that doesn't necessarily go into the ROI. There are two good transformational metrics that you can use. And perhaps that helps how you can describe it to your senior executives. Uh, one is how many out of hours, uh, out of hours, man hours does it take to deploy something in production? Yeah, so how, many how much time are people spending on weekends after hours to deploy something in production? If that is zero, then you're pretty mature. Um, because that means you're basically doing it, doing business hours with no impact. And the second one is how long does it uh, take, or what is the man hours that it takes to validate that something is ready for production? This is where all your penetration testing, regression testing, integration testing, all that stuff fits in. Those are two pretty good metrics in my view. How do you calculate real-time readiness score? What metrics go into it? So I gave a couple of examples for that. Um, as I said, it's kind of, some of them are pretty obvious, which are uh, things like uh, known defect at this point in time, um, how many requirements have recently changed, um, and uh, build and deployment failures. But we did look at some other stuff around frequency of check-ins. Right? So if you're getting pretty close to release and your check-in frequency increases rather than goes down, that's another one that um, is, is a kind of a, a smell that you might want to put in there. But they will be different between the different organizations. Does the dashboard, dashboard, yeah, dashboarding approach work with an arbitrary metric? <laughs> well, the stuff that I showed you um, basically normalizes the story points from the agile perspective. Um, you can't use story points in any kind of comparative way. Right? I mean, and you probably all learned that it's not a matter of uh, my team delivers 5,000 points and yours only uh, 400. That, that's not how it works. So I would be really careful with story points. Story points have a different, point, uh, a different uh, uh, idea behind it. They're for your teams to plan. And they're different to estimates, because estimates are for you to understand how much money or how much resources you need. That's not what metrics are, uh, what user story points are for. But that's a longer, longer conversation. So in-depth measurement should be priority in solution design to reduce data technical debt and to improve and reduce cost. So, in your automation process, I mean, if you, one of the things that I found really hard in my early career was to actually get to these baselines. Because if you have a manual process, how can you actually get a baseline? Besides sitting next to someone with a stopwatch, right, or checking things, or trusting ticket systems that are horrendous very often. I had a client where we look at the tickets to understand how long it takes to solve something, and there were 25% of tickets that were resolved before they were opened. So they, were, they, had, they had time travel sorted back then. Um, but that's because it was just drop-down lists, right? And so, you know, people pull it in, and they just use the default, and off you go. Um, if you're doing automation, that stuff becomes a lot easier, because it's not a big problem to add another step in Jenkins that writes down into a, into a log XML file that you can then consume by something like Splunk, yeah? Um, it's not that difficult to add something to your test automation to then actually write this out as well in a, in a machine-consumable format. Automation allows you to do that. If you're trying to measure manual stuff, just forget about it. Just start with some automation and measure that, and then measure how you're getting better. Because the base on, on manual is pretty hard to do. How could you get senior executives to change their mindset when improving business value doesn't necessarily correspond to improving personal value? Yeah, well, uh, I'm not a psychologist. Um, but I can tell you that some of the examples that I gave you, um, I've done with relatively senior guys in a room. And you can see some of the light bulbs going on. Now, that is the first step. Well, I can tell you what doesn't work. It doesn't work as an engineer to just go in there and say, I know better. Um, I had this, this situation um, as a very junior guy, um, COBOL <laughs> programming. And COBOL programming, I'm not sure if many of you know that, um, but you have to write code at a certain column. Right? So you have to start in column seven or whatever it is in, in the file. Um, and so I went to my engineering manager and said, look, that's pretty stupid, but right? I have to upload it to the mainframe to get a compiler error that tells me I've, you know, I've started it in column five. Um, so I said, hey, we can use a, an IDE um, that will help us. And this, this engineering manager <laughs> stands like this in front of me and says, like, Mirko, we have been writing mainframe code for 20 years. And only because you are young and you don't know what you're doing doesn't mean that we need tools for this. So that opportunity went out the window. Um, and probably because the way that I approached it was uh, perhaps a little bit too, you know, like, oh my god, I can't believe you're still doing this. And you know, haven't you not learned anything from Java where we use like, Eclipse? And that didn't work. Right, so you really need to put yourself into their mindset, their problems, and help them understand how to solve that, um, and use all the goodness that you have, because you have the arguments on your side, to get them on, on your page. Yeah, and that is, it is hard. I'm not going to say that it's trivial. Um, invite them to conferences like this. 
right? Get them to talk to other people who are going through this journey. All the organizations are on this journey. I mean, if you, if you are an enterprise organization that has done the full transformation and you are in a place where you say, we are really, really cool, talk to me afterwards because I haven't met anyone like that yet. Yeah, so we are all in this together and it's a long journey and the good thing about this journey is that we're all happy to share. Right? We're all happy to share our scars and um, the things that we, we've learned from um, so that we don't all have to do the same mistakes again because there's so much more to do. And with that, I will take it as my closing comment. Thank you.